Section 1. Introduction. This video comes in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to continue in my usual style, working through an example with as many pictures and as much intuition as possible. However, since we've now met most of the high-level ideas usually encountered in a first course in algebraic number theory, at least in passing, I think now is a good time to draw the parallels between our small examples and the more general theorems you'll encounter in a more traditional course. That'll take up the second half of this video. So, last video we proved that z adjoin root 2 had unique factorization. That is, every non-zero element is a unique multiple of a unit and a finite product of prime elements. We could discuss the primes in z adjoin root 2 as we've done for other rings before, but in this video I want to focus on the units. We know that there are infinitely many of them, and it's not entirely clear how to describe them algebraically. For that, we're going to need a trick. Section 2. Logarithm space. Remember our picture of z adjoin root 2 from last video? We had two embeddings, f1 and f2, of z adjoin root 2 into the real line. f1 sent root 2 to root 2, and f2 sent root 2 to minus root 2. By embedding it in both simultaneously, we regained our original lattice picture, but this time inside an honest geometric space. And we noticed that an element u of z adjoin root 2 was a unit if and only if f1 of u times f2 of u was equal to plus or minus 1. That means our units lie on these hyperbolas here. How can we describe them? Okay, to make the next step easier, I'm going to take the absolute value of both sides. I'll rewrite this as mod f1 of u times f2 of u equals 1. Then I'll split up the mod sign. Mod f1 of u times mod f2 of u equals 1. Now here's the trick. We're going to take the logarithm of both sides of this equation. Log of mod f1 of u plus log of mod f2 of u equals the log of 1, which is 0. Let's call these numbers L1 of u and L2 of u. So u is a unit if and only if L1 of u plus L2 of u equals 0. Let's do what we did before and try to draw this space. Here's an L1 axis, here's an L2 axis, and for every unit u in our lattice, Let's write L of u for the point with coordinates L1 of u, L2 of u. Now, here's the space L1 plus L2 equals 0. It's just a line. And we've shown that if u is a unit, then L of u lies on this line. I'm going to call this line logarithm space, because L is a kind of logarithm map. Now, we could try just working out what a few of these points are, taking logs and then plotting them on the right-hand diagram. For example, the element 1 is a unit, and on this left-hand diagram it lives at the point 1, 1, so on the right-hand diagram it lives at the point L of 1, which is log 1, comma, log 1, which is 0, comma, 0. Or, for example, the element 1 minus root 2 is a unit, and on the left-hand diagram it's here, so on the right-hand diagram, taking logs, it's here. Well, this is nice, but it's not obviously helpful yet. We could have done lots of things to this picture on the left. Why have we chosen to take logarithms specifically? Section 3. An algebraic description. All the way back in the first video, I gave a rough idea of our goal. That is, to describe a multiplicative theory of rings other than z. So, the point of what we're doing right now is to work out what multiplication looks like in z adjoin root 2. Hopefully, if there's any sense to what we're doing, it'll help us explain how units multiply. Here's the first thing to notice regarding units and multiplication. If u and v are two units, then their product uv is a unit too. Right, for example, you could calculate mod the norm of uv, which is just mod the norm of u times mod the norm of v, which is 1. Okay, what does that mean in logarithm space. Well, it means that if L of u lies on this line and L of v lies on this line, then L of uv lies on this line. But 
L is a logarithm. So L of uv is just L of u plus L of v. In other words, let's try and see this from another perspective. If L of u is here, representing the unit u, and L of v is here, representing v, then their vector sum, which is this plus this, also represents a unit, u times v. Right? You can do the same thing with inverses. If u is a unit, then u inverse is a unit. And that's the same as saying that if L of u is on this line, then L of u inverse is on this line. But again, by the rules of logarithms, this is just minus L of u. So if we know a few of the units in logarithm space, we can add or subtract them to get more units. For example, if we know a unit, u, say here, then u squared is here, u cubed is here, u to the 4, and so on. And we have u to the minus 1, u to the minus 2. If this is looking familiar, then your intuition is right. It's not too hard to show this is actually another lattice. And this time, since we're constrained to this line, we have a one-dimensional lattice. That's going to make it very easy to describe. Section 4. Fundamental Units Let's take a one-dimensional lattice. Here's the origin. Now, if we know one of the points closest to the origin, say this one, then we know every point on this line is just an integer multiple of that point. So if this is a, then this is 2a, 3a, 4a, and so on, and minus 1a, minus 2a. So in the logarithm space associated to z-adjoin root 2, our units lie on a one-dimensional lattice. Can we find one of these two points nearest the origin? Well, an easy calculation shows that this point here is the point representing 1 minus root 2. We'll discuss that more next video. So its square is here, its cube is here, its fourth power is here, and so on. And its inverse is here, its inverse squared is here, and so on. And that's all the points on this lattice. In other words, if u is the set of units in z adjoin root 2, we now completely understand L of u. In other words, the image of u in logarithm space. It's just this lattice, made up of logarithms of integer powers of 1 minus root 2. Okay, well, we're almost there. How can I convert this information back out of logarithm space? Now that I know what L of u looks like, how can I work out what u looks like? What we're really asking for is the kernel of L. That is, when we passed from u to L of u, how much information did we lose? You might be tempted to guess that u is just the set of all integer powers of 1 minus root 2, but that's not quite true. The problem is that multiple points in z-adjoin root 2 might have the same image under L. For example, we've already worked out that L of 1 is 0, 0, but we didn't take into account the fact that L of minus 1 is also equal to 0, 0. In fact, in general, L of minus u is going to be equal to L of u. Logarithm space can't tell the difference between u and minus u. But you can check from the formula for L and see that this is the only information you lose. Minus signs disappear. So geometrically, when we applied L, we collapsed both sheets of this hyperbola onto the same line. And now that we want to go back, we're going to have to separate them out again. So when we try to describe u, we're going to need to put those minus signs back in. I'll just put a plus or minus sign at the front here. And so now, finally, we have a full description of all the units in z adjoin root 2, and we know exactly how they multiply. For those of you who know group theory, we've shown that the unit group u has a torsion part of order 2, generated by minus 1, and an infinite cyclic part generated by 1 minus root 2.
<laughs> this concludes the first part of this video, so I'll see those of you who want to continue with examples rather than theory in the next video, where I'll be discussing the close connection between Pell's equation, continued fractions, and these fundamental units. For the rest of you, let's move on to the second part. Section 5. Norms and the Canonical Embedding If you've watched the last two videos, you'll know that our rings always have a bunch of embeddings into the complex plane. Some are imaginary, some are real. An imaginary quadratic extension of Z has two imaginary embeddings, which are complex conjugates of each other. Pick either one of these, then our two-dimensional additive lattice picture embeds nicely inside the complex plane, because the complex plane is a two-dimensional real vector space. A real quadratic extension of Z has two real embeddings. Now, neither of these embeddings individually preserve the lattice picture, in part because we're trying to squash the two-dimensional lattice onto the one-dimensional real line. In order to get our lattice picture back, we need to at least embed it into a space that's two-dimensional. And so we embed it using both of our embeddings at the same time. The same problem arises in higher dimensions too. Let's take z of alpha, where alpha is a cube root of 5. This is a cubic extension of z, which means that its integral basis has three elements. In other words, its additive picture is a three-dimensional lattice. This means no matter how we try to embed this into the complex plane, a two-dimensional space, the lattice is going to collapse somehow. But z of alpha has three embeddings, one real embedding, and one pair of conjugate imaginary embeddings. So we can do the same thing. Let's pick either one of our imaginary embeddings, and our real embedding, and form their product to make a three-dimensional real vector space. Turns out that z of alpha embeds into this space as the three-dimensional lattice picture that we'd expect. And this is actually true very generally. Let's take a Dedekind domain O, which is an n-dimensional extension of z, that is, its additive picture is an n-dimensional lattice. Call the number of real embeddings R, and the number of imaginary embeddings 2 times s, that is, s complex conjugate pairs of imaginary embeddings. Then it turns out that n equals r plus 2s. Moreover, if we call the real embeddings f1 up to fr, and the conjugate pairs of imaginary embeddings g1, g1 bar, up to gs, gs bar, then we can form the composite embedding, f1 along one real axis, f2 along another, and so on up to fr, then g1 into one copy of the complex plane, g2 into another, and so on up to gs. Each of the real lines is one-dimensional, each of the complex planes is two-dimensional, and so by putting them all together we get an r plus 2s dimensional, that is n-dimensional real vector space, and our n-dimensional lattice fits neatly inside here. This is what number theorists call the canonical embedding. Until now, I haven't actually told you what the norm of an element is in general. I've usually just given you a formula and hoped that you believed me. Well, now I can finally define it properly. If x is an element of O, then the norm of x is defined to be the product of all the images of x under all the embeddings of O. So, f1 of x times f2 of x up to fr of x, times g1 of x times g1 bar of x, and so on up to gs of x times gs bar of x. Section 6. Minkowski's bound and primes. Same notation as before, a Dedekind domain O with R real embeddings and S pairs of imaginary embeddings, with R plus 2S equals N. So, the canonical embedding sends O into an n-dimensional space and embeds it nicely as an n-dimensional lattice. This is just our intuitive additive lattice after some linear transformation. Now suppose you've got an ideal J of O, that is, a sub-lattice inside this space, and you want to blow a small convex bubble of elements of small norm to try to bound the number of ideal classes as before. Let's say your bubble contains elements alpha whose norm is between minus k and k. So the absolute value of the norm of alpha 
is at most k. Let's apply our formula. The norm is just f1 up to fr times g1 times g1 bar up to gs times gs bar. Then I can distribute the absolute value over all the factors. I've also combined the imaginary embeddings with their conjugates since complex conjugation doesn't change the absolute value. Now, just like last video, this region usually won't be convex. So instead, let's look at the smaller region given by the stricter inequality, mod f1 of alpha plus mod f2 of alpha plus dots plus mod fr of alpha plus 2 mod g1 of alpha and so on up to 2 mod gs of alpha is less than or equal to n times the nth root of k. Now, where has this come from? Well, this implies our original inequality by the AMGM inequality, and it's convex. You can check that. Just like our previous pictures, the real embeddings give you lines, and the complex embeddings give you circles, and they're stitched together somehow. Our long, tedious calculation to find the volume of this bubble later, and we get the Minkowski bound. 4 over pi to the s times n factorial divided by n to the n times a volume scale factor. The scale factor is the square root of a number called the discriminant of O. Okay, using the ideal rescaling lemma, as we have done a couple of times, this strange looking bound gives us a very sharp bound on the number of ideal classes of O. In particular, the number of ideal classes is finite. So even if O doesn't have unique factorization, it's somehow only a finite distance away from having unique factorization. We can draw a finite multiplication table for its non-principal ideal classes. We can now go ahead and attempt to find the primes. This involves tedious calculation in each case, but we at least have the outline of a method, and we know roughly what our answer will look like. If it's a unique factorization domain, these will be prime elements. If it's not, they'll be prime ideals. And in any case, as before, all we have to do is check to see how primes of z split, ramify, or remain inert to find all the primes of O. Okay, well, so much for primes. What about units? Section 7. Dirichlet's Units Theorem. I'll keep the same notation as before. A unit of O is an element U such that the absolute value of the norm of U is 1. Let's plug in our norm formula. Let's move the absolute values inside. And finally, I'm going to combine the imaginary embeddings with their conjugates. Mod G1 of U is equal to mod G1 bar of U, and so on. This is now a product of a bunch of R plus S positive real numbers. Now, as before, let's take the logarithm of both sides of this equation so that the product turns into a sum. I get a sum of a bunch of numbers. Let's call them L1, L2 up to L R plus S equals zero. So our units lie inside some R plus S dimensional space. In fact, they all lie on this hyperplane defined by this equation here, which is an R plus S minus one dimensional space. And as before, it's not hard to see that they're going to form a lattice inside this space. How big is the lattice? Well, using Minkowski's theorem for some well-chosen bubbles will allow us to find R plus S minus 1 linearly independent elements inside this space. So the lattice must have dimension R plus S minus 1. All right, let U be the group of units. As before, we've given a full algebraic description of L of U. Now all we need to do is work out how much information we lost by taking logs. But all we lose when taking logs is the finite group of roots of unity. So U is the direct product of a free abelian group of dimension R plus S minus 1, and a cyclic group of, say, the mth roots of unity. We can now go ahead and try to find this many fundamental units and work out what this M is. And again, this involves some often very difficult computation in each individual case. But we now have a good understanding of what the answer will look like. For example, 
We've seen already that imaginary quadratic fields only have finitely many units, and now we can see why. They have no real embeddings. They have one pair of complex conjugate imaginary embeddings, and so this free abelian part of their unit group has rank 0. It's easy to show that there are two, four, or six roots of unity here, as mentioned previously. For real quadratic fields, on the other hand, well, the only real roots of unity are plus or minus one, so that's the finite bit sorted. For the free abelian bit, there will always be two real embeddings, corresponding to positive and negative square roots, and there'll be no imaginary embeddings, so there's a free abelian part of rank one, and we have a fundamental unit to find. Next video I'll show how we might go about computing the fundamental units for real quadratic fields in practice.